Hello, I'm Cheng Lim Lee from Synergos. I'm delighted to introduce you to a story of radical collaboration that developed despite divisiveness and polarization. In 2020, the high courts in the Eastern Cape of South Africa found that the Makata municipal government failed its constitutional duty to provide public services, such as trash collection, electricity, and water, services that residents had paid for. The response has been for Makana's government and constituents to come together to overcome obstacles through an initiative with Kagizo Trust and Synergos. Their collaboration has deepened, in fact, even as litigation continues. For those of you unfamiliar with our organizations, Kagizo and Synergos each have 35 years of experience and share a vision for a more prosperous, peaceful, equitable, and just society. Kagizo Trust is one of South Africa's leading development agencies, having worked strongly against apartheid and uplifted communities with targeted education and enterprise development programs. Synergos is a global organization that has pioneered the use of bridging leadership to establish trust and collaboration on complex problems with results that reach scale. But trust-based collaboration is not a given, and we will hear from my Synergos colleague, Marlene Ogawa, and from Kagizo Trust's Paul Smith and how they have achieved just that in Makana. Before we turn to Mar Marlene and Paul, let's first listen to some of Makana's residents. I was born in Alistair. 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 I was born in so your father is CV, is CV, I go over la over, but I can't give back. I will just cut your money, John. Na manzi, ke kutala ukala zelo manzi, amanza wako clean, awako right. You see, the other day there was a lamp pole that shot fire here in this place, and our kids is playing around here. And you know, it's very dangerous. So we pay for these things, and we need you guys to to do a service delivery. I'm a business owner. Our greatest challenge in Grahamstown is service delivery. Bottles is one of the ones. Uh, dumping sites as well. I mean, obviously dumping sites means that there is no service delivery for picking up refuse and stuff like that. And now to generate more revenue, I mean, how can they, how, how will they generate more revenue if the municipality is working half a day? But I can guarantee you, their salaries are not half. So I have been in Grahamstown for the past 10 years. Um, when we got to Grahamstown, it was great. Um, we had running water. The roads weren't as bad as they are now. Um, so it's very frustrating waking up in the morning, opening your taps and there's nothing. Getting reports from Makana saying that it'll be fixed in two days and then actually sitting without water for about 10. So I was able to Bonke and Abanba Gamaspala, Basilian San and Abashal, the Alistair Willis, the main Queen Gela Ea Yung Akal, Kutra Shung Angela Ea Zong Abashal, Silung Celebra Mabal, A to Iolo Zetu, Silung Celebris Trat was a to his barney, Scalas and Dui one at Alistair, I de Oyakal, too. So Sitella Ezont at Alistair. So Paul. Kagizo has equipped local governments across the country's nine provinces with tools to improve the overall functionality of municipalities. What was different about your work with Makana? Uh, well, Makana was, was one of our primary sites where we were offering financial services to improve revenue management and data management. But uh, with our experience in, in several other municipalities, we realized that we needed to do something else. Um, and what we needed really to focus on was to try and build the relationship between municipalities and communities. And uh, we re uh, communities are, are under pressure at the moment in South Africa, the, the high growing levels of unemployment, um, poverty is increasing, and uh, the demand for social support is on the rise. Um, and at the same time, municipalities are collecting less revenue than they, they usually collect. And uh, so find, uh, providing sustainable services is not always possible. And so the only way we found to, uh, the only way we believe we can solve this problem is by narrowing the gap between 
municipalities and communities. So what was the starting point for the collaboration? Uh, the starting point was um, uh, uh, the, the, the revenue management project that I mentioned. And uh, through the relationships we built up with the municipality and the community during that project, we, we decided as a, as a trust to, to also look for alternative ways to support the municipality to, to support marginalized communities. And so we adopted a, a, a new approach and, uh, and then approached the municipality to enter into an, a, memorandum, a memorandum of understanding. And so some of those, uh, the new ideas was to focus on building municipal capacity around the indigenous management, local economic development and community engagement. But the, the initial intention was to build municipal capacity to better manage marginalized community and engage marginalized communities. It didn't really take into account that the, the fragmentation of communities was gonna be an obstacle to success. And after performing a status quo investigation, we found um, a couple of interesting things that, uh, that the municipality uh, was underperforming, but despite that, the environment for development was, was, wasn't really conducive. Um, communities were polarized, stakeholders were polarized, and everyone agreed that change was needed, but no one could really agree on how to implement that change. And so we found that even building capacity within the municipality, it was unlikely to be successful or have any impact. What we really had to focus on was building relationships and galvanizing the community. Mm -hmm. And so we set out to, to, to reiterate our program and focus on community engagement as the central point of our program. Marlene, do you have anything that you'd like to add? What also was part of the journey has been that Cajiso has a, a unit called Cajiso Institute for Inner Work. And they focus on confronting realities. So took the municipality through a process of looking at the performance, the statistics around the performance and understanding why the performance is so poor. And as part of that process was also looking at the tensions and the dysfunctionality within the municipality. The gift of that process was truly that they confronted the realities in an open and vulnerable way. It was really important to start working with individuals and, and getting individuals to to, to change from being reasonably egocentric to system centric and start thinking differently about the environment. And so we started preparing uh, community stakeholders first as individuals, then as institutions, and then as a collective group uh, to, to prepare them for collaboration with the municipality. And at the same time, we had to start preparing the municipality for collaboration. And, uh, and this was a little bit more difficult because municipalities in South Africa generally are inward and upward focused instead of downward and outward focused. And so we had to spend some time working on, on leadership and there were some green shoots. People uh, latched onto radical collaboration and others didn't. We started getting people to think differently about the situation and how they pitch up every day. And, and in order to get uh, the levels of trust and, and uh, build relationships with stakeholders, we had to be collaborative ourselves. And, and that meant we had to follow a certain, a certain set of principles that enabled us to be collaborative. And those principles are, first of all, our intention was collaboration. It wasn't issues. So we had to be collaborative in, in terms of our intention. We had to, to be open. Um, we had to make sure that, that people really um, created a climate of honesty and trust where everybody's opinion counted and was respected. Uh, we had to build in high levels of self-accountability uh, for the unintended consequences and, co and consequences of our behavior. And this was really important because um, in, in the type of uh, polarized environment, people were very readily or very easily would transfer responsibility to someone else and never own responsibility and never become, uh, uh, become accountable for some of the things that were happening in the town. So self-accountability was really important. And then self-awareness, we had to understand that what triggers we had in our own personalities and in our own beliefs and set those aside so that we could have an open, meaningful conversation. And we had to impart some of those skills onto others and then problem solving um, and negotiation. We, we always had to look at solving problems for the, for the outcome of the community. So um, taking people through this process was very interesting. We had to go through the process ourselves. But in the end, 
there were some that were early adopters and we had to look for those early adopters that were influential. And uh, once we had a group of those people around, we could take the process forward. Um, I must emphasize at this point that the outcome of these discussions was never a Kahisa trust intention. Our intention was to facilitate the process and allow for communities and stakeholders to decide themselves how to move, move forward in a, in a meaningful way. Do you have any stories that you can share on what some of that has looked like? Yes, I, I do have a couple of stories. And, and, and funny enough, most of these stories take place in a, in a more social context than anything else. And uh, one particular story is, was a discussion with a restaurant owner who said that uh, 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 the dysfunctional municipality wasn't going to affect them. But what they didn't take into account is the medium to long-term view, that people were leaving the town, businesses were leaving the town, and the patrons for that restaurant would eventually disappear and there wouldn't be a business. And after having that discussion with the owner, uh, the mindset changed and their willingness to participate became a little, uh, they became a little bit more keen to participate. And so when we get those opportunities, we need to build on that momentum. That's an amazing story, Paul. Um, Marlene, can you say a little bit more about what Bridging Leadership has looked like? So as Paul mentioned, in terms of the journey that has been followed, it structures it around relationship. And Bridging Leadership, um, we invite a partners to intentionally build relationship because we also feel people have to connect with each other before they can do work together. And so the journey has been intentionally bringing together the municipality, civil society, both NGOs and community leaders, as well as um, the university and other sectors within the community to look at what's the relationship that needs to be built and bridging leadership intentionally structures and designs for those relationships. What we also look at within bridging leadership is the individual within the larger system. And so how does the individual show up? How does the individual recognize both their gifts and talents, but also where they have to strengthen their skills, both their, their personal self-awareness skills, their personal reflection, but also their technical skills. And often we find like in Makana, there is strong technical skills, but however, how it's used to bring quality service delivery to the communities is sometimes a challenge. So how do we allow leaders to reconnect to their personal purpose into their professional purpose and then show up in the community in that way of service and be servant leaders to the community? And that's largely the invitation of bridging leadership from the individual into the collective, into the system and navigating the system with others. You mentioned uh, um, leaders and equipping leaders. Are you talking about formal leaders? For us, it is everyone as a citizen of Makana or a citizen of any municipality. So intentionally working with the municipal leadership and that is both political and administrative, but it is also the civil society leaders that organically come and emerge out of the community and respond because there's an issue, whether it's a waste management issue, water issue, youth development challenges. Chong Lim, can I add to that? Absolutely. Uh, when we initially started this radio collaboration route, um, it was quite important for us not only to facilitate conversations, but at the same time provide the leaders that did commit to opportunities to engage around some issues. Uh, and these issues provided the dance floor that we could start molding these relationships into something meaningful. And so we didn't abandon indigenous management or local economic development strategy, development, et cetera. All we did was broaden the audience and start bringing uh, stake community stakeholders into the process to share their views. And the strangest things happen because whilst people were technical about local economic development or indigenous management, they also started getting along better and started respecting each other a little more and appreciating each other's opinions. And, and each one's opinion was molded by somebody else's contribution. It sounds 
Paul, from what you're describing, that a lot of the collaboration actually gels in the action of doing the work together. Um, it's, it's not sufficient to have the ideas of collaboration as important as the theoretical and the, the, the principles and intentions are. And equally, uh, Chong Lim, that you know, if we jump into action quickly without considering or understanding or deep sensing the situation, I think action becomes the enemy of thought. Mm -hmm. And so we end up with unsustainable solutions uh, being proposed and implemented. But if we give ourselves, uh, our ourselves a little time to, to really consider the options, and, and because when we're dealing with societies and people's lives and multiple stakeholders and a government sector as well, it's a really complex problem. So there's no simple solution. It's a complex solution. So we've got to apply complex thinking to this. Mm. Yeah, I'll just add to that, Paul, in terms of our historic challenges, right? When we think about social justice and where we come from as South Africa, there's always been these tensions. And I keep asking, what's the continued um, speaking our truth, healing, reconciliation, transformation that needs to happen within societies? And so um, Makana is also a picture of how South Africa has shifted in a lot of ways in terms of our transformation, but also how we still very much um, segregated, separated um, in terms of wealth, in terms of where we live, in terms of how we live. And so it's a kind of a dual um, transformation, both as individuals, but also our communities. So Makana has Makana West that's more resourced um, uh, and, 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 and privileged and in Makana East, that's, that's uh, where a lot of poor and vulnerable people live. And it's also um, cut right down the racial lines. And so what's the transformation that needs to happen across communities? And so the hope continues to be, um, we do these sensing journeys so that we can intentionally take leaders through, community members through, uh, processes so that they can see different perspectives. And it not only allows them to see situations, but also to tr truly see each other. And we invite people into that vulnerability so that they can um, acknowledge each other's stories and truths and then move forward. So it's really what we also call inner work for social change. And John Lim, you know what's really uh, uh, interesting that came out of this project, something that wasn't intended is through the education cluster, we've impl implemented two robotics clinics in, in Makana East. And these robotics clinics are now offering over a hundred grade seven learners access to coding and robotics. And they've been integrated into the broader robotics fraternity and starting to compete in local competitions. So not only is the skill of robotics and coding really important here, but the integration. I am as good as anybody else and I can compete at the same level. And this psychological shift is really important for all our communities. I can see and how that doesn't, you know, that doesn't feed into improved garbage collection, but it, it, it shows the, the kind of expanded impact that can happen in the community. Um, what you're looking for ultimately is the health of the community, right? And I think, you know, we, we mustn't be naive to think that everybody thinks the same as we're thinking. Um, there are many of our leaders, and, and many of them narcissistic in nature, who prefer a polarized community. Uh, uh, this provides them the opportunity to, th to thrive. And so we are, we are experiencing uh, pushback from many quarters, and this just needs to be ex expected. But I think once we get a groundswell of collaborative people, the leaders will change. Leaders will start listening more attentively to the needs of community. And that means in the Makana Circle of Duty, one of the principles that was adopted that's really important is, is the distributive leadership model. It means you don't have to be a leader of your community to lead an initiative. And, and not all communities work like this, though. Some communities want mandates and to, and to elect people to represent them. But we also have to be, understand this and accommodate it in the process. Paul, linked to what you said, across uh, these clusters and groupings uh, of initiatives, is the need for dialogue and deep dialogue and conversation. And, and for that, the re, and the relational skills needed are deep listening and understanding, setting aside our egos and listening to each other, right? And how do we manage the relationships? And also the continued awareness 
because if we listen to each other and we understand each other's needs um, and really feel compassion, it allows the space for us to co-create.